This lecture is called Derrida and the Animal. It is a lecture on Derrida's work, The Animal That Therefore I Am. Uh, the rather nosy fellow you see in the picture is my dog, uh, Shia. And he is, uh, as you can see here, he's, he's uh, going to be present today for uh, this lecture. He has a personal stake in this. Uh, and we're going to see, too, as we get further into our uh, lecture, that, uh, it's a, that, that, that the question of the animal is also, for Derrida, a question of the nose and, uh, and of smelling, of the sense of smell and its neglect in the history of philosophy. Why are there no philosophers of smell? Uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, question. Um, but we will, uh, it's a question that we'll pursue, uh, among others. All right. So to, to begin here, uh, allow me to read a, uh, a quote from Derrida that we saw in my, in the last lecture, when we looked at the key concepts of deconstruction. And this is uh, the idea that deconstruction is a matter of accounting for the possibility of responsibility of a decision of ethical uh, commitments. All right. So, uh, contrary to the, the false idea, the, the, the dishonest mischaracterizations of Derrida's work that are uh, very you know, prominent on YouTube today and other places that he's interested in the utterly corrupt pursuit of power. You know, we're going to see here, particularly in the case of the animal, that uh, Derrida is, is um, this, this, this is a wonderful example of how, uh, you know, deconstruction is um, you know, not just a matter of taking things apart, but it's a matter of assuming a responsibility, an ethical responsibility. As we said in the last lecture, deconstruction is all about responsibility and taking responsibility. And here Derrida is going to say, in this case, of the, in the case of the animal, if I am responsible for the other before the other, isn't the animal uh, more other still, more radically other, if I might put it that way, than the other in whom I recognize my brother, than the other in whom I identify my fellow or my neighbor? If I have a duty, something owed before any debt, before any right toward the other, wouldn't it then also be toward the animal, which is still more other than the other human, my brother or my neighbor? Okay, so... Um, uh, and there's, you can see there's Derrida and his own cat, his own very real cat. Um, and, uh, but let's, let's stop here for just a minute because if, if deconstruction is about assuming responsibility, uh, to the other, for the other, because we live, you know, in a world with others, um, there's, there's a very, uh, interesting sense in which, uh, the animal, uh, for Derrida is, is even more other than the other with whom uh, we uh, uh, co-inhabit the other, to put it in Heideggerian terms, Dasein, with whom we co-inhabit this, uh, the, the, this planet. And, uh, and there's, there's a very prominent theme in Levinas uh, about you know, the, the face of the other and how the face of the other uh, solicits a particular kind of a response uh, uh, from us. Now, uh, someone like, um, Deleuze is going to say that the, 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 the face in, uh, in Levinas is a hype. It's a hype. He promotes a kind of a hypostasis of the face, which is a kind of metaphysics. That's an interesting question. And then we're also, you know, Derrida does a deconstruction of Levinas on the animal as well, because when, anim, when Levinas is asked, uh, well, what about, you know, does an animal have a face? And his response is, uh, well, I don't know. Does a snake have a face? And, and Derrida is going to observe the, the, ch the choice of the snake for the particular animal that he uh, uh, references is, is not uh, uh, incidental. Um, but, you know, a snake is, is uh, historically, we know that the snake in the garden. But if we think of, you know, animals like, uh, like, like this animal here, this guy here, you know, he has a face. And when we look at that face, you know, we, we ask ourselves, uh, well, what, you know, it, it, what, who is this other? And remember, when we talked about the visor effect, we said that, you know, the visor is kind of like the eyelids that open and shut, open and shut. And uh, we also, you know, just discussed how 
you know, when you look into the eyes of someone else, when you know, when you look when you know, deeply into their eyes, you know, uh, you say, well, what do you what do you see when you look into those eyes? And if you look carefully enough, as I'm looking here in the camera, again, I only see myself in this case. Uh, if, if I'm looking into your eyes, then, you know, there's a there's a reflection of you on the lens of my eyes. But, uh, it, you know, but, but if uh, there is such a thing as a soul or an essence or a quiditas or whatever this or, or, or what uh, Derrida is going to call in his deconstruction of Heidegger, a kind of an intact, irreducible kernel, um, whatever that whatever that is, or also what's referred to as ipsity, we don't know what that is, is if there even is an is there. We, we just don't know. Um, and uh, that that's true, not just when we look uh, into the eyes of the other, but but others who are even more absolutely other from me, like an animal whom I can't, you know, I can't read. If I can't read your mind, I certainly can't read uh, the mind of an animal. And so we're, we're confronted with a kind of an enigma uh, in which the animal uh, for Derrida becomes a kind of an absolute other, an other that is absolutely other. Heidegger in uh, the fundamental concepts of metaphysics will also speak about the animal with regard to what is called trans uh, position. We can't transpose ourselves into the consciousness or mind uh, of an animal. I can't even do that. I, I can't transpose myself into, um, into your mind either. Uh, uh, so uh, the animal presents, it, it uh, stands before us as a kind of a mystery, a mystery of otherness, but an other for whom to whom I have a responsibility. Okay, so this is clearly uh, a, a very wonderful example. This book, the animal that therefore I am, of uh, of, of taking responsibility for the other, of of, of rethinking our responsibilities uh, to uh, to the animal and to uh, animals. And so again, I challenge anyone who's listening to this uh, lecture to tell me how this is, a, is about the desire to dominate others. This is about, you know, the utterly corrupt pursuit of power. How, 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 how is that so? Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's, again, it's a false characterization of Derrida's work. Um, so this is a good example of, of though deconstruction at work uh, in, as a matter of taking responsibility, responsibility for the other, in this case, the absolute other who is the animal. Uh, now, just kind of a background note to this, uh, Avital Ronel, uh, who's also a very interesting, wonderful theorist, written some fascinating work, was very uh, closely uh, associated with Derrida, knew him quite well when, when Derrida was still alive, uh, was, was I, I think, was the person who should be credited with kind of goading uh, Derrida to look uh, more deeply into the question of the animals. So this is one of the later texts that he wrote. Uh, but I find it to be a very profound text, and um, uh, uh, I think uh, many of the students that I've worked with in the past and other faculty who've been introduced to it, uh, who've read it, um, I, I have I felt the same way. Is that this this is a powerful deconstruction? This, although it's a small book and it was written, you know, late in his life, and it doesn't have the the kind of because he was older at this time, he was, he was approaching his later years doesn't have the same kind of, say, conceptual rigor as you would find, say, in of grammatology. Uh, uh, it, it, it nonetheless is, uh, uh, I, think it's, I think it's probably among the two or three most important books that he read. Uh, so I would urge you to become uh, familiar with it if you're interested at all in Derrida and deconstruction. It's a central work in his corpus, okay? Now here we see Derrida with his very real cat sitting on his lap, just as I showed you my very real dog who's sitting next to me during this uh, lecture. And Derrida likes to you know, make clear, uh, likes to emphasize that this is not a figure of a cat that, that he's discussing, who, who, uh, who watches him as he moves about in his house. Like he s describes, for instance, standing you know, in, 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 in the bathroom, t uh, changing before taking a shower or something, and then the cat's watching him, and there's this sort of strange moment where he's being observed by this other, uh, this other who sort of sees without being seen, to put it in a, a Sartrean terms. Uh, and so the, the animal does see us, but he, the animal sees without being seen. 
Uh, and we too see without uh, being seen. When we look upon the other, there's this mystery. And we said, again, in the last lecture that this disjuncture, uh, you know, this, this mystery of, uh, is, is something that is at the heart of uh, our relation to the other and something that is, is in fact, in effect, uh, not a bad thing, but a very, a very good thing. It's the very condition of, a, of the possibility of there being an ethical uh, relationship to the other. And this includes the other who is the animal for whom, to whom we have a, uh, a particular kind of responsibility since the animal is, uh, as, as to put it, in, as Heidegger is going to say in the fundamental concepts of metaphysics, uh, you know, poor in world or held in, in, in captivity. The animal is, is held hostage by us. And so as such is, uh, is, is, is in a position of disempowerment, which, um, you know, which, which heightens the, 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 the question of our responsibility to it. Okay. Now, uh, before we get too far into examining this text, I want to just pause for a minute uh, on the title because, um, for many of you uh, that, that may be reading this, you don't or are not uh, don't read French, uh, and uh, so the, the 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 fact that the title is what it is is significant uh, to to uh, to the to the French question of of the what the sui here is in this uh, l'animal uh, uh, que donc je suis uh, so uh, or the animal that therefore I am now obviously that's a reference to Descartes the cogito of Descartes the um, the uh, you know the, the the Cartesian claim you know I think therefore I am and man being the thinking thing or the thing that thinks and that being what distinguishes man from the animal well here this is a kind of a playful reference to Descartes but it's also an assertion of animality that that uh, we are uh, animals and so what does it mean to be an animal but the title has a double meaning and so you can see there on the left the French uh, verb être which is to be which is conjugated as je suis, so it says je suis uh, uh, is, means I am, but then suivre is the word to follow, and it's, and it's interesting, it's predicated uh, in the same way, so that it, it, it appears and it sounds exactly the same as I am. So je suis means I am, but je suis also means um, I follow. And so the title could then be therefore read the animal that therefore I am, or it could have very well been translated as the animal that therefore I follow. And Derrida likes this uh, ambiguity. It's, it's essential to his thinking of the animal. And we're gonna see how this is so. Okay, so let, let's return again to an idea we already investigated in our discussion of Descartes when he made the distinction between the adventitious and the innate idea. And he said, now, of these ideas, some seem to be innate or metaphysical, tra uh, tra transcendental, hardwired in the brain, to put it in Chomsky in terms, uh, archetypal, to put it in Jungian terms. Others are adventitious, sensual, path-dependent, empirical, and to come from outside, and yet others to have been made and invented by me. Now, in this case, so we think of the adventitious idea. Remember that, that Mr. Descartes is going to say that animals... Uh, have adventitious ideas, uh, and uh, but but they don't have innate ideas. Okay, so the adventitious idea would be like the idea. I mean, it would be akin to like what happens when I take Shia out for a walk, and he he stops and smells every uh, every uh, thing along the way, and so the the he he's, he follows a scent. He follows uh, a trail. He follows a, a trace that is uh, an empirical. Uh, external trace and his knowledge of that empirical external trace, this adventitious trace, comes to him uh, from the uh, outside. Okay, now remember we said one way of saying this when we talked about the British empiricists is that for Locke, by contrast, or David Hume, there are only adventitious ideas. All uh, the mind is a blank slate and all ideas come to us uh, in this path dependent way. Um, now, uh, uh, the, the, the Cartesian claim is, and, the, and the Chomskyan claim with regard to UG, uh, his claim that it's an organ in the brain uh, that is, of course, a hypothetical organ or kind of a, a fluid that is ejaculated into the brain, which he also explicitly compares to semen, 
but which makes it very similar to the Platonic idea of, of the seed in Timaeus, is a kind of a semen or a seed or an ejaculative uh, liquid floating in our brains that, uh, that, that animals don't have. And because they don't have it, uh, they don't have uh, they, they don't have language. That that's one uh, claim. Okay. Well, uh, this question of why are there no philosophers of the nose is therefore then a very kind of uh, provocative one. If the if we think of the uh, uh, the empirical trace, and this is an important deconstructive idea as something that is empirical and uh, external. And exists on the uh, on the outside, and so and so that we too, like the animal, follow traces around. I'll give you one really fascinating uh, example of this: is in um, in Derrida's book, um, The Beast and the Sovereign, which was there are two volumes. In the first volume, I believe it is that there are he, he has a discussion of Robinson Crusoe uh, by by Defoe, and in this uh, in this uh, case, this which is from these lectures that he gave. Uh, you know, as opposed to like, say, um, of grammatology or dissemination, which are, you know, books that he wrote, um, that he, in this example, he, he has this wonderful example where Robinson Crusoe is on the island that he's you know, stranded on. He comes across some footprints and he looks at the footprints. And he goes, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm not alone. Someone is on the island. So he starts following these, these footprints and they go and it leads them all the way in a circle, all the way around the island. He comes back and he realizes, oh, they're my my footprint. So he's, he's following his own trace. Okay. Now, now this is uh, you know, like, like a dog following the scent. Uh, Robinson Crusoe is following his own steps. And, uh, and the trace, if we think of the name as an empirical external, uh, you know, uh, you know, sign that is, uh, you know, sort of literally signed onto our flesh, cut into our flesh in, in terms of, if you think of it in terms of circumcision, uh, but becomes in effect the the proper name, the sign that is most that is most closely uh, associated with you know the entity that we are. Um, this is one of the reasons why Derrida is going to say that that there's no, uh, I mean that autobiography is one of the most toxic genres imaginable. Think of uh, you know um, uh, Augustine's Confessions, because if we think of, if we think of the 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 name uh, or the I even literally, which is an empirical external sign. Every time I say I. I mean this ipsity within me, but the eye is an empirical external sign that exists in uh, discourse. Uh, and if we think of our name as having that sort of empirical external, uh, you know, uh, quality, uh, then uh, you know the, the, the name is is like a, uh, you know, it, it's it's an image of myself. A, 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 like, and if I look at myself in the mirror, if I look at a photograph of myself in a, in a kind of a narcissistic uh, fashion, the name would be who I am. And so if I'm following my own trace or my own, you know, trail, the tracks that I leave or the external empirical representations of myself, I'm, I can literally make myself sick. I can, it can become very a kind of a toxic, um, uh, you know, a toxic uh, a making of myself sick with the sign that represents myself. But again, as Derrida is going to also observe, uh, you know, there's no, uh, narcissism and non-narcissism, you still, you know, you have to embrace the uh, empirical external representation of yourself uh, as well. It's, it's a matter of what he's going to call an open uh, narcissism or closed narcissism as in, as in a kind of a closed circuit. Okay. But in any case, I hope this gives you some indication of what we're talking about here, why the uh, adventitious ideas as in, you know, the, the dog with the nose following the, uh, the trace is, is, is an important notion related to who we are, not just as you know, these, these beings endowed with logos, but as, uh, as uh, you, know, uh, you know, more actual you know, uh, empirical external people uh, in the world who are, have, uh, this, have this as a, something that is akin to, to the animal and is in fact a part of our animality. Um, okay, so Derrida asks, what, what is meant by to follow, more to follow, to pursue, uh, even to uh, persecute? What does one do when one follows? What is it I am doing when I am following? Do, let's say, the steps that I take when I follow the other resemble the running of an animal that finding its way on the basis of a scent or a noise goes back more than once over the same path? to pick up the traces, either to sniff the trace of another 
or to cover its own path by adding to it? Why is the zone of uh, sensibility of smelling uh, so neglected and reduced to a secondary position in philosophy uh, and the arts? And this is this is a really interesting uh, question to consider. Is there such? Can you be a philosopher of the nose? And how about a philosopher of the uh, the, the taste buds? Uh, how about a, a, a sensual philosopher? A philosopher. Of of, the, of 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 touch and of feeling, uh, these are all uh, uh, important questions worthy of consideration. Okay, so when Derrida says "qui suis-je" or "que suis-je," this you know you can translate "qui suis-je" as "who am I," "que suis-je" is "what am I," or it could mean "qui suis-je" as in "who am I following?" "Who follow I?" or "que suis-je." What am I following? Okay, this is again the question of the who and the what. This is a Heideggerian theme that you'll find in uh, in being in time and in uh, the fundamental concepts of metaphysics. You know the the the, the key and the qua, the who and the what. Derrida also uh, works with this following Heidegger. Uh, so uh, this is he's going to say uh, it's important that this question resonates in the French language, and so that's why we're taking a moment to clarify. Its, uh, its meaning in French, which, which we lose in the uh, English translation. Uh, the question of the I or the I am or I think in Descartes, he's, Derrida is going to say, would have to be displaced towards the prerequisite question of the other, the other me that I am following or that is following me. Okay, this is a really important observation, so let's just pause on this for a, a second here, um, because what makes the key suija as in who am I following or what am I following? An important question for Derrida is because it, it's a question that um, disrupts the narcissism of the Cartesian question of the assertion of pure being, which is a solitary in, interior individual uh, you know, claim that again, that he, you know, he, he retreats into the sensory deprivation tank. He's, you can't think of a more, when you, when you think of the cogito in, Descartes, you can't think of a more uh, striking instance of what it means to be alone, to be a solitary individual uh, in, uh, you know, in a solitary confinement, even uh, totally uh, uh, apart from the rest of the humanity and even apart from one's own uh, body. Now, this other question of who do I follow or what do I follow? Um, once I ask the question of, of who am I following, what am I following? Um, I'm thinking about the other. It's it's an other directed question. So this is is a far more profoundly ethical question, a question of response of, of responsibility to the other, as opposed to let's say the sublimely indifferent thinking consciousness of Descartes that that, that assumes this kind of a godlike uh, condition of of uh, being solitary and alone. Um, okay. Uh, Derrida's ethical decision regarding the other. So um, let's let's stop here again. I want to just take another, another second here. Let, allow me to say briefly. So we've said that uh, unlike those who falsely characterize deconstruction as is as some kind of corrupt act, uh, it's uh, of power. The deconstruction is about taking responsibility for the other and uh, uh, taking res and, and, and respond, which means you're literally responding to others, which includes. Uh, the animal. And so um, I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs here that are um, very revelatory in terms of, let's say, to put it in Marxian terms, the praxis of Derrida, the, 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 the political decision that he makes uh, about the animal. And that he came, you know, he came to relatively late uh, in, in his life, but he, he makes, you know, he, he makes a decision about the animal, and it is it is a profoundly moral decision that he makes with regard to the uh, animal. And so, um, far from it being you know uh, an irresponsible uh, you know corrupt question of of the pursuit of power for Derrida here, um, it, it, you may find yourself uh, responding to this by saying, "Wow, this is the implications of the of the of the responsibility that he takes for the animal are pretty." Uh, pretty far-reaching, and and if you really were to embrace the position that he embraces, you know, you'd have to ask yourself, well, what does this mean 
for me, what in my relationship uh, to the animal, I think he's provoking us to do that. I mean, like, should I become a, a vegan? Should I become a vegetarian? How how should I relate uh, to the animal? Now, again, I'm not it's not I'm not here to propose any uh, uh, correct answers to those questions, but rather to think about the question that he the questions that he's raising with regard to the animal and what it does imply for our responsibilities uh, to and towards the uh, towards the animal. Okay, uh, here's Derrida. For almost two centuries, intensely and by means of an alarming rate of acceleration, we who call ourselves men or humans, we who recognize ourselves in that name have been involved in an unprecedented transformation. This mutation affects the experience of what we continue to call imperturbably as if there were nothing to it, the animal and or animals. However one names or interprets this uh, alteration, no one could deny that it has been accelerating, intensifying, no longer knowing where it is going for about two centuries at an incalculable rate and level. Beyond the hunting, fishing, domestication, training, or traditional exploration, exploitation, excuse me, of animal energy, it is all too evident that in the course of the last two centuries, these traditional forms of treatment of the animal have been turned upside down. However one interprets it, no one can deny this, even that is the uh, unprecedented proportions of the subject, uh, the subjection of the animal. No one can deny seriously anymore for a very long time that men do all they can in order to dissimulate this cruelty or to hide it from themselves, in order to organize on a global scale the forgetting or misunderstanding of this violence, which some would compare to the worst cases of genocide. Okay, so uh, that's, that's worth uh, uh, stopping for just a moment. Uh, and reflecting upon. So if we think about, um, for instance, I mean, a, Mar a Marxian critic might re refer, to, think of this in terms of reification, you know, if we, which is, you know, thingification, the turning of, a, of something that's not a thing into a thing. Uh, obvious example of this process might be, you know, going into uh, the grocery store and buying a big glob of uh, pink cow meat wrapped in, you know, uh, cellophane uh and or plastic and uh you know and it's just a big glob of pink substance that i go home and cook on a grill now that's that's very different let's say when we when we discussed for instance uh how aristotle uh thought about you know animals aristotle unlike you know descartes for whom the animal was simply you know a machine without uh the language faculty uh you know again remember in descartes man too is a machine but a machine with you know logos inserted inside of it so but after descartes uh, he, uh, Descartes, we could say Descartes divests the animals of, of, of a soul, which, which was a principle that the animals had in Aristotelian, uh, in the time when Aristotelian, say Thomas, uh, you know, metaphysics prevailed in, uh, in, in Europe. And so now the animal no longer has a soul after Descartes. Thank you, Mr. Descartes. And, uh, and, and the animal, um, as, as such, uh, can, can be treated like any other machine and dismantled and used for our a benefit. We can think of, you know, Kant's going to call, for instance, the animal uh, a providential animal, an animal that providence uh, provides for us to uh, consume as and do with as 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 we wish. Um, uh, and that's that's a uh, uh, that would be again an idea, you know, of, of reification. But uh, it's I, I'm noting the example of the glob of meat that we buy in the grocery store in relation to dairy, what Derry is saying here. Because, uh, you know, for, for many people raised in an in industrial uh, capital, late capitalist society, um, we don't, we have no idea where the, we don't kill our own animals. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, we don't butcher our own animals. Now, there, obviously, there are exceptions. There are people that do this still. Um, and if you've ever uh, had the experience of, of killing an animal before eating it, it's a very different kind of experience. Than, uh, than just buying a glob of meat at the, uh, at the grocery store. But uh, and I think it's a uh, wonderful example of this, also the same idea as Alice B. Uh, Toklas's cookbook. You know, she, she observes that, that cookbooks are like murder mystery stories uh, because they always sort of start with the murder and the murder, you know, which is in effect the killing of the animal, uh, which, you know, which is an un kind of, we know this is not something we like to think about before we eat that nice 
uh, you know, uh, roast beef or, uh, or, or, or cooked goose or whatever it is that we're eating. So, so we, we deliberately hide this from ourselves. And this is what Derrida is, is, is pointing out here is we, we, we don't want, this is a, these are truths about the killing of animals that, that happen on this mass scale. And we don't want to know about it. Uh, now in the case, he, he, this is now here, I think is going to get even more provocative. You got to remember, this is a Jewish uh, author who, 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 who in his own life was as a, as a kid was deeply affected by the, the, uh, by what happened under the Vinci uh, government in France uh, when he was, his family were French citizens and lost their citizenship. And so he grew up in the shadow of the Shoah. He, he, he knew, I mean, all of his life, the, the Holocaust would have been, uh, you know, something that, that, that was, uh, you know, loomed very large in his uh, personal history. And so, he, but here we find uh, uh, Derrida comparing factory farming to the Shoah. And many people might find that uh, problematic, uh, but this, this is what he's, this is exactly what he's doing, which shows you this, the, how strong he's, uh, his, the, how, how powerful the decision is that he makes regarding the animal in this deconstruction. Uh, the annihilation of certain species, Derrida says, is indeed in process, but it is occurring through the organization and exploitation of an artificial, infernal, virtually indeterminable survival in conditions that previous generations would have judged monstrous. Okay, certainly any of the generations prior to Descartes. Uh, outside of every presumed notion of a life proper to animals that are thus exterminated by means of their continued existence or even their overpopulation. As if, for example, instead of throwing a people into ovens and gas chambers, let's say Nazi doctors and geneticists had decided to organize the overproduction and overgeneration of Jews, gypsies and homosexuals by means of artificial insemination so that being continually more numerous and better fed, they could be destined in always increasing numbers for the same hell, that of the imposition of genetic experimentation or extermination by gas or by fire. Uh, everyone knows what terrifying and intolerable pictures a realist painting could give to the industrial, mechanical, chemical, hormonal and genetic violence to which man has been submitting animal life for the past two centuries. Everybody knows what the production, breeding, transport, and slaughter of these animals has become. It's nothing, he's not telling us anything new. He knows that, uh, but he's also telling us we don't, you know, even though we know it, we just don't want to uh, think about this hell on earth that we have created for the animal and for uh, animals. Uh, he, here's again, he'll say, if these pictures are pathetic, if they evoke sympathy, it is also because they pathetically open the immense question of pathos and the pathological, precisely that is, of suffering, pity, and, uh, and compassion. Okay, so, so, um, so he knows that, that, that and from a rhetorical perspective, you know, uh, uh, it, let's say, you, you know, you like to uh, eat uh, animals and, and uh, you don't agree with uh, the, 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 the views of those who promote animal rights. Uh, this, this kind of litany of descriptions of, um, of factory farming, which he could have, there could be a lot more. I mean, it's, we, it, it, it can be very, all, all you got to do is just Google factory farming and then look at the images and you'll see what I'm talking about, what Derrida is talking about here. Um, but he knows that, uh, that speaking uh, in this way, uh, some of us we might find it annoying, but if we, if we listen to it and we attend to what he's saying and we think about really, if we stop for just a minute and think about what factory farming is and what it mean, what it has meant for animals, uh, it, does, it does evoke our pathos or our sense of pity. Uh, our, our, our sense of compassion, okay? And if our sense of compassion is awakened, this is important for Derrida because it leads us to a thinking of, of a very different kind of question than the question that Descartes raises about the animal. And that he's gonna say that the history of, in the history of philosophy, every philosopher seems to have, with a few exceptions, seems to have followed this, uh, uh, this, this path. And that is to think of, um, 
to ask to ask the question, well, what you know, do animals have language? Do animals have reason? And that becomes for Descartes and for you know so many philosophers after Descartes, especially the definitive question. Well, what if the real question that we should ask is not do animals uh, have language, but rather do animals uh, suffer? Uh, do they have? Can they suffer? Is it you know, is it possible to, for animals to suffer? And, uh, and, 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 you know, you don't have to be, uh, you know, uh, a genius to, 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 I mean, all you have to do is just, you know, ask yourself in your own experience, have you, have you ever seen an animal suffer? Can you doubt that animals have the capacity to suffer? Um, and it's, it's, it's very, it's impossible to doubt that animals suffer. Uh, uh, but the question is, is why do we want to, should we ask that question? And, and for Derry and I is going to say, well, yeah, with this, the, the pathos that awakens when we think about factory farming should, should, uh, lead us to, uh, ask this, uh, question, you know, can animals suffer, which for Derry and I is a, is a far more important question because it's linked to our responsibility to the other, to the other who is the absolute, uh, other who, who is the animal, as opposed to this question of, do animals think? Do they have language? Which is not a responsible. That's not a responsible question. It's, there's no taking of responsibility in the prioritizing of that question, which was very different from the taking of responsibility that is very clear in the question. You know, do animals or can animals uh, suffer? Okay, so uh, he's going to uh, uh, reference Jeremy Bentham who was one of the early proponents of animal rights. Here's a quote from Bentham. I am unable to comprehend how it should be uh, that, to him, uh, that, that to him to whom it is a matter of amusement to see a dog or a horse suffer, it should not be a matter of like amusement to see a man suffer. Uh, and this is, he said this in 1825 in a, in a letter that he wrote that was published in a, in a newspaper. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's a good point. I mean, if you if if, if you can't comprehend, you know, if, if you think it's funny uh, watching a dog suffer, uh, then why isn't it? Why wouldn't it be funny for you when when you're watching a human being suffer? And what 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 would that say about you know you uh, as, as a person uh, in terms of your ethical responsibilities uh, to others? Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's a fair question, you know, do animals suffer? And this is going to be the question that, that's going to be at the forefront of Derrida's inquiry into the question of the animal. Now, I note here, too, Bentham, and Bentham was uh, responsible, was associated with philosophy called utilitarianism. There's things that are very problematic, I find, uh, in his thinking. But with respect to questions of animal rights, he was certainly uh, uh, ahead of his time. Uh, Bentham said something like this, the question is not to know whether the animal can think, reason, or speak, etc. Something we still pretend to be asking ourselves, from Aristotle to Descartes, from Descartes especially to Heidegger, Levinas, and Lacan. Uh, and, and remember, he's all of these thinkers he's going to criticize uh, as being, you know, not uh, 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 being, being too oblivious to the question of the animal or not or, or not thinking uh, sufficiently about the question of the animal. And this question, you'll say, determines so many others concerning power or capability and attributes, being able, having the power or capability to give, to die, etc. Thus, the question will not, uh, be, will not be to know whether animals can speak or reason thanks to that capacity or that attribute of the logos, uh, and, and logocentrism is first of all a thesis regarding the animal the animal deprived of the logos. Uh, let me let me pause here for just a second and, and and draw attention to the one part of this question which we haven't discussed yet. We've talked about the logos and the animal not having the logos, and that's what you know makes the animal different from humans or in in Chomsky in terms this organ that you get universal grammar. Um, but here he, he alludes to the capacity to die. Now this is a Heideggerian uh, uh, theme you'll find in the fundamental concepts of metaphysics. And this is going to say, Heidegger's going to say, well, that, that one of the main differences between uh, humans and animals is that animals don't, uh, uh, they, they don't die in the sense of having a, a relationship to, uh, to time and to, and to temporality. The animals don't, ha don't have a thinking of time because if they did, that would, they would be uh, uh, doing a philosophy. Uh, asking the question, you know, of, of questions of temporality. So for Heidegger, 
an animal, as Derrida would say, an animal can croak. It'll just, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll uh, croak and, and fall over and be dead, but, but not, it won't have, but animals don't have a thinking uh, of their own death. And for Heidegger, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, and Heidegger, and I think Derrida is, is, you know, he does pick up on this theme in other places, like on the gift of death. He's going to say, um, you know, um, like we six of fake Jesus on the cross. Well, if Jesus died for you, that, that Derrida will say that doesn't mean that he died in your place because everybody has, everybody dies uh, alone. And so dying alone, you think of Mr. Descartes, you know, with his mind, which is this sort of this, it's a, it's a, he's a, it's a, it's a fantasy, of course, but he imagines that it's this ipsity that is separate from his body that would be totally alone in this narcissistic sense. Uh, but um, the the death is uh, for Derrida, and I think you know, and, and for Heidegger and for Derrida, uh, it's it's something that we all do by ourselves. That so, no one can die. If someone can die, if Jesus died for me, he can't die in my place. I have to die, and when I die, I die alone. Now I can be surrounded by family members, but death is an experience that I do uh, completely uh, by myself or alone. And so this is is important for Heidegger also because it's a guarantee the, the the death that we experience uh, by ourselves alone uh, is also a guarantee of our own you know in individuality. It's what it makes us you know irreducibly different from all others uh, that, that with, with whom we inhabit this planet is is the solitary nature of our experience of death. And so Heidegger is going to say, well. You know, animals croak, but they don't have an experience of, of death, not in the way that, that human beings do. And this is what and Derrida he criticizes this. I, I can't, by the way, I'm not going to be going into a reading of, um, of Heidegger. Of Derrida, Derrida does a really interesting reading of Heidegger's fundamental concepts of metaphysics. It's attached to the end of this text. It, 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 would, it raises a lot of really complex questions that would require a whole separate lecture in itself. And I'm, so I'm not going to be bringing that into this lecture except a few comments in passing. But I do urge you to have a look at that if you're interested in understanding differences between Heidegger and Derrida, because there you find Derrida uh, and being very, you know, sort of uh, guard down, frank about his, because it's kind of a free associational talk that he gave about what differences are between him and Heidegger. And this emerges very clear in, in the question of their orientation to the animal. Okay, uh, so the, the, the animal uh, is, is, the, is the being that can't have the logos, man can have the logos. This is the thesis position or presupposition maintained from Aristotle to Heidegger, from Descartes to Kant, Levinas, and Lacan. All right, and so this is, this is again, like, like uh, with the exception of Bentham, uh, uh, Derrida finds that the, in the, you look at the history of Western philosophy, this claim that animals you know, don't have the logos, and this is what makes them different from human beings, um, is, is, the, is, is the decisive question for, for these philosophers. But for Derrida, the first and decisive question is not do they have language, but rather can they suffer? Uh, can animals suffer, asks Bentham, simply yet so profoundly? Once its protocol is established, once we put this question at the forefront of our inquiry, the form of this question changes everything, for it no longer simply concerns the logos. Okay, and so, uh, so what we'll see here then is that the animal has, and uh, in, in, in the way that Derrida is articulating this, and he's also getting this, you know, uh, there's also, this is in Heidegger as well, Heidegger is going to advance these thesis, you know, that uh, you know, the, 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 I talk about differences between humans and animals that, and, and, and objects like a stone is going to say doesn't have a world, uh, doesn't have world. An animal is poor in world. Man is going to say is, uh, is, is world forming. And this is, a, these are theses that he advances uh, in, his, uh, in his fundamental concepts uh, of metaphysics. But this idea that if an animal has world, man has world, animal has world, but a stone has no world, that, that, then, then therefore man and animal both have world. Uh, and this is going to be, you know, Derrida is going to point out this is problematic in some sense because Heidegger at a later point will even acknowledge that we don't really know what world, what he's calling world, you know, means. Uh, however, uh, uh, animal having uh, a world or a world, but being, you know, poor in world implies a power like man has the power, man has world, 
but uh, uh, it's it's a power that's a weak power. Okay, so so this this weak power, it's it, like you say, it's a, it's a there's a man has ability, animal has a disability. So this is where the thinking of Heidegger and Derrida also intersects with say disability studies. That it's 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 an ability that's that's a disability, a weak uh, ability. But but this weakness has can have a profound power, uh, you know, within it. Um, and other other thinkers, as we'll see, are going to pick up on this idea of, of a weak power. Okay, so Bentham, Bentham's question, can animals suffer, amounts to asking, can they not be able? And what of this inability? What of this vulnerability felt on the basis of this inability? What is this non-power at the heart of power? How should one take it into account? What right should be accorded to it? To what extent does it concern us? Being able to suffer is no longer a power. It is a possibility without power, a possibility of the impossible. And remember, this is one of the definitions of deconstruction uh, for Derrida is the possibility of the impossible. A more, and, and then here again, uh, uh, this, uh, which again shows us that Derrida is a profoundly moral and responsible thinker. A morality resides there as the most radical means of thinking the finitude that we share with animals. The morality that belongs to the finitude of life, the possibility of sharing this non-power with the animal, the possibility of the impossible, the anguish of this vulnerability and the vulnerability of this anguish. For no one can deny the suffering, fear or panic, the terror or fright that, we can, that, that can seize certain animals and that we humans witness. The response to the question, can they suffer, leaves no doubt. In fact, it has never left any room for doubt. All right. So if you want, if Mr. Descartes wants something that he, does, he, that he can no longer doubt, this is something that this is this is this is a something that we can't doubt. Yes, we know that animals suffer and we've always known that animals suffer. The question is, is do we care? Do, is the, do, we, do we ever ask ourselves that question and and this this question of the suffering of animals is you know, again it's very central to to the thought of Derrida. Um, okay, so here here again I'm just going to briefly in, in uh, animal therefore I am at the, again as I said at the conclusion of it Derrida is going to is going to address Heidegger's theses on the animal and on man. Uh, it says Heidegger only rarely advances theses. Derrida observes that's certainly true. His discourse is a questioning discourse. Uh, still, he is going to put forward the proposition that the animal is poor in world as a thesis. He will even present these three theses. The stone is world forming, the animal is poor in world, and man is, uh, is, is world forming. Okay, so uh, that's, that's, uh, those are some key things. That's some key passages from Heidegger that Derrida is working with. And again, as I said, if you look at the uh, conclusion, the animal, therefore I am, you'll get a very fascinating and concise, uh, uh, you know, cataloging of, of differences between Heidegger and Derrida, what makes them different in their orientations. Um, okay, uh, Gianni Vitimo, I mentioned in passing, uh, because he's one of these philosophers who's who's really picked up on this idea of, of, a, of, of weak thought, what he, what's called weak thought from Heidegger and from Derrida. He wrote, he actually co-wrote a book with Derrida called Religion that was published in 1998, where Derrida articulates some of his key concepts about religion. Uh, Vatimo is, is an Italian philosopher. He's still alive, still doing important work. Uh, one book you might want to look at, this would be a, a good example of what you know, call, I've called left Heideggerian thought, is, her, is his book Hermeneutic Communism, which he co-wrote with Santiago Zabala, published in 2011. Um, he also did a put a volume together called Deconstructing Zionism in 2013, uh, which we'll return to when we look at Specters of Marx by Derrida. Those of you that are uh, that are reading that text with me this quarter or, or following this lecture series on deconstruction, because in Specters of Marx, Derrida has um, you know uh, a great deal. Uh, uh, to, I mean, it's to say about, you know, what it's going to call the, the, the figure of Jerusalem, the, quite, the thinking of, of the question of Jerusalem uh, as this world uh, capital of the three Abrahamic traditions who are fighting over Jerusalem uh, is, uh, a, 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 is a key aspect of Specters of Marx. Okay, 
Um, all right. So, but but we're, what we're talking about here is uh, carnophallologocentrism, and uh, this is a term which you know uh, in, in our previous discussions we've talked about phallologocentrism and how logocentrism is always already phallologocentrism, which which implies that the thinking of logos becomes gendered very early on in the history of Western philosophy. Uh, and, and we also said to say phallologocentrism is in some sense uh, redundant because logocentrism was always already phallologocentrism. It's just that calling it phallologocentrism draws attention to this fact. Um, now, here in this text, Derrida is also going to observe that phallologocentrism has also always already been directed against uh, animals as well in, 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 uh, in defining the animal relationship to the having or the not having of, of logos. Okay. So let's, let's read Derrida. He's going to say, according to many philosophers and theoreticians from Aristotle to Lacan, animals do not respond and they share that irresponsibility with writing, at least in the terms in which Plato interprets writing in the Phaedrus. What is terrible about writing, Socrates says, is the fact that like painting, the thing it engenders, although similar to living things, do not respond. No matter what one asks them, writing, writings remain silent, keeping a most majestic silence or else re always replying in the same terms, which means uh, not replying. Okay, so just again to review, this is one of the reasons why we spent so much time in the earlier lectures really carefully clarifying a uh, fallow logocentrism so we can think of this what we call the the logic of the dangerous supplement as well we can see this um this at work in 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 the, in the animal as well so that if we have the logos which is the transcendental ideal word inscribed in heaven and then we have the spoken word which is said to be a copy of that word and it's an inherently more truthful word because it implies the presence of the speaker which is again this idea of the metaphysics of presence is a, uh, it's an essentialist way of thinking about you know the word um, and and then writing which implies the the death or the absence of the speaker is a copy of speaking and so writing is a copy of a copy and so we said uh, Plato scapegoats writing this is what the pharmacon is it's a kind of a scapegoat so he's not they're both writing and, and speaking we said are both matters of of the world and, and of becoming they both uh, you know, uh, partake of the four, you know, elements, uh, four primal elements, but he, but he creates a hierarchy in which speaking is said to be inherently more truthful to, than writing. Writing is, 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 uh, again, a dangerous supplement. It's useful. It's, uh, it's, it's necessary, but we've got to be careful about it because the, the truly, the true truth, truth, more truthful word, the truer copy of the, uh, Logos is the um, spoken word, which again is he also compared to like a uh, 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 the, the the legitimate son versus the Ill illegitimate son. Okay, um, and Derrida, you know, takes that binary and he reverses it, and uh, and and so we get we we get a thinking of, of uh, as we're going to see a, a thinking of speaking and writing, uh, in which neither of these terms in this binary are, are stigmatized in the way that Plato. Uh, you know, stigmatizes writing. Okay, but that same that same logic he's going to observe here that he discussed in Phaedrus is true in uh, in, the, in the question of of animality as well. All right. So again, we think of when Plato says you have the the, the bed in heaven, the ideal bed, the bed that is that you sleep on, which is a copy of that, and then the bed that the painter paints, being kind of a supplement to the actual uh, bed. We get the same thing with we think of of, of uh, you know, the logos, we think of man, and then we think of animal that's positioned underneath man uh, in this uh, in this hierarchy in the same way that, that woman is, is positioned beneath man in this uh, fallow logocentric hierarchy as well. And this is what he's drawing our, our attention to. So again, uh, uh, logocentrism, fallow logocentrism is for Derrida always already, uh, you know, uh, carnal fallow logocentrism and one of the reasons why it is is because just like you know the uh, the, the painting which is which doesn't uh, speak or, or the writing which always says the same thing over and over again uh, doesn't you know respond in the way that a living speaker responds so too the animal uh, is different from man because the animal cannot you know respond it doesn't 
respond when we speak to it, much like writing doesn't respond when we speak to it. And so the question in philologocentrism, carnal philologocentrism, really comes down to the question of, you know, responding and the question of what is responding? What does it mean to say? What, what we, do we even know what it means to respond? Now, this also, again, we've, we've talked about this previously in our discussion of Cartesian linguistics as a matter of, of recursion. So we could think of what, what Derrida is calling response here is, is the same thing that Chomsky is calling recursion and where Chomsky is going to insist this is what differentiates us from animals. So Chomsky's views about animals are very straightforwardly uh, Cartesian or neo-Cartesian response recursion. This is, this is what Derrida is focusing in on. So we're going to follow this for just a minute here. Okay. So, um, Let's continue. Um, uh, here, well, I'm going to refer to, I'm going to call Alice's non-recursive kitty. This is from Alice in Wonderland, which Derrida cites early in, uh, in the animal, therefore I am. Uh, he's, this is actual, the lang this is the language of Lewis uh, Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland, who says, it is, it is, very, uh, it is a very inconvenient habit of kittens. Alice once made the, and I've added here, very Cartesian remark, that whatever you say to them, they always purr. If they would only purr for yes and meow for no, or any rule of that sort, she had said, so that one could keep up a conversation. But how can you talk with a person if they always say the same thing? On this occasion, the kitten only purred, and it was impossible to guess whether it meant yes or no. Okay, now this is a wonderful passage from uh, Alice in Wonderland. But it's, it's, this, is, this is really crucial if you think about this in relation, say, to the social contract, all right? So one of the reasons why we're going to see why the animal is excluded from the social contract, from what Rousseau, for instance, will call the social contract, which is a thinking of, that Kant's going to pick up on, is that animals, we, you know, we don't know, we, you know, if, if I say yes to the social contract uh, and agree to to uh, you know live within an assembly of other human beings in which I place prohibitions upon myself. I have to either say yes to that contract, or maybe I'm like a, a rogue uh, figure in a in a novel by the Marquis de Sade who who deliberately refuses the social contract. Well, when the kitten meows, we don't know if 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 the meow means yes or no, and so. The, the, the devastating consequences for animals with regard to this is that they're thereby uh, excluded from the social contract, which means they're outside the law and therefore uh, a free game in terms of, of uh, killing and eating. So for instance, no one, if you go out and shoot a deer and then you cut it, cut it up and eat it, no one's going to say that's a matter of murder. But uh, whereas if you did the same thing with a human being, well, you're going to get thrown uh, in, in, in prison and maybe executed. Uh, so, uh, the, the, but because the deer uh, can't uh, say yes or no, it has no, it has no, it's, it's outside the law. And so therefore it's not a, a matter of murder to shoot and kill uh, a deer or an animal in the same way that it would be a human being who's protected by the social contract. Okay. Um, so Derrida is going to say the said question of the said animal, he says said because you know, he's, he wants to draw attention to the problematic, very problematic nature of the very word animal and the very word question, which we'll return to in a moment. Uh, he says that the, the said question of the said animal in its entirety comes down to knowing uh, not whether or not the animal speaks, but whether one can know what respond means and now and how to distinguish a response from a, uh, from a reaction. Okay, so do we even really know what we mean when we say that animals can't respond. And is it really true that animals cannot respond uh, in, in the way that uh, we respond? And this is, this is a question that is uh, uh, a pretty interesting and provocative question once we think about it, okay? So here's Derrida on Alice in Wonderland. This famous passage from Phaedrus about paintings, which interested me uh, greatly in the past, and if he's thinking here again of his very, uh, prominently known, uh, well-known essay, uh, Plato's Pharmacy from Disseminations, which we've already discussed, you know, just like the theme of the animality of writing would have to be compared with that from Alice in Wonderland. We are told there that the cat does not answer because it always replies the same thing you know, and is thereby excluded from the social contract. What counts when it comes to speech, uh, Derrida observes, would be above all exchange or the question response 
coupling. Again, what Chomsky is going to call a recursion. Okay, so this this is so this is is uh, what in the final analysis, this is what we uh, what we really uh, you know uh, privilege when it comes to thinking of differences between you know humans and animals. And certainly, I mean, the, the question of uh, you know does language ha does animal have you know language or logos can be an interesting philosophical question. This question is more crucial because of it, because of the political implications that follow from it. Okay, so we want to then distinguish. Let's make a distinction here between what Nietzsche Nietzsche is going to call man the promising animal, as opposed to the, the the providential animal in Kant. So this is what you know. One of the things that makes man man is is for, as Nietzsche is going to observe is their ability to. Uh, 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 make covenants. Nietzsche said at the very beginning of the second treatise of the genealogy of morals that man is a promising animal, by which he meant, underlining these words, an animal that is permitted to make promises. Nature is said to have given the task of raising, domesticating, and disciplining this animal that promises. Okay, I think here again of, of, of nature in Kant's perpetual peace as, as those of you doing the deconstructive uh, lectures uh, will recall, we, we discussed how uh, uh, providence in Leibniz becomes uh, nature in, uh, in, in, in Kant or, or becomes progress in Kant and, and, and God in uh, Leibniz becomes nature in Kant, which is a more sort of secularizing of, of these Leibnizian concepts. Uh, but here, but, but in Kant's view, you know, nature, which is effectively... Uh, the dissimulated term for God is said to give itself the task of raising, domesticating, disciplining this animal uh, that promises, which is uh, which is man, man the promising uh, animal. Okay, uh, I, I want to bring in here a very provocative uh, quote from uh, Milan Kundera, and uh, those of you that are uh, that are doing this series of lectures where we're looking at animal metamorphosis. Uh, are, are going to be reading Milan Kundera. For, the, for those for others of you who are just uh, listening to this, uh, I would urge you, this is a wonderful book by Milan Kundera called The Unbearable Lightness of Being. We're going to see him saying here something very similar about Nietzsche uh, and that, that Derrida is going to say, and he's going to refer to this very famous story. This is a, this legendary story about Nietzsche's final descent into madness when he was... Uh, at a hotel in Turin where he lived and he came out the door one day, he was already, you know, really suffering, uh, uh, uh having a mental crises, mental crises. And, um, uh, he saw a, a man whipping a horse to death. And, uh, and then in fact, when the horse couldn't get up cause it was exhausted, the man started, you know, whipping the horse's eye, I think, you know, Jim Morrison, the doors even did, did a song about this. Uh, like when all else fails, you can whip the horse's eye. Well, this is this is a legendary image of, of cruelty to animals. And, and Nietzsche's response to it was, um, you know, was to fall uh, into tears, to take the animal in its uh, head and its lap and, and, and to, 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 to cry. And at that moment, you know, because Kundera observes this was the place, this was the moment when uh, you know, nature. This this was precipitated his final sort of break from uh, from humanity. Uh, here's Kundera how he write, uh, describes it: seeing a horse and a coachman beating it with a whip outside his hotel in Turin, Nietzsche went up to the horse and before the coachman's very eyes, put his arms around the horse's neck and burst into tears. Nietzsche was trying to apologize to the horse for Descartes, his lunacy, that is, his final break with mankind began at that very moment he broke into tears over the horse. That is the Nietzsche I love, stepping down from the road along which mankind, the master and proprietor of nature, again, another Cartesian uh, uh, formulation in this in, uh, discourse on method, marches onward, okay? Now, um, uh, you know, wow, that's 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 pretty uh, interesting. And uh, if we think of, you know, a lot of times people say, well, why read philosophy? You know, what's, you know, philosophers just sit around splitting hairs. Uh, we can think of, though, what you know, the, 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 the disaster visited upon animals because of, of Descartes 
And this idea, you know, that, you know, that Nietzsche is, is apologizing to the horse for Descartes, you know, one a, a, a philosopher apologizing to an animal for another philosopher. It's a very provocative uh, image. And certainly uh, uh, Descartes has a lot to answer for in his thinking of the animal. Here's how Derrida will uh, respond to the same incident in the animal therefore I am. He's going to say, Nietzsche was mad enough to cry in conjunction with an animal under the gaze of or cheek by jowl with a horse. Sometimes I think I see him call that horse as a witness and primarily in order to call it as a witness to his compassion. I think I see him take its head in his hand. All right. So this has been this is uh, one of the reasons why Derrida loves Nietzsche, why Kundera loves Nietzsche. Uh, and uh, again, it also points to how Nietzsche's thought, although often characterized in similar terms as being about, all about you know, power, um, is, is, is also uh, Nietzsche was a profoundly ethical thinker in his own, uh, in his own right. Okay. Um, all right. So he's going to say, uh, here's what uh, Derrida is going to say. For Descartes, it is no longer simply a matter of an inability on the part of the animal to respond to whatever is said in its presence, which could a call, a re, an order, a noise, uh, to which Descartes knew full well the animal responds or reacts, but of responses to questions, questioning concerning what is asked of them, as though the animal were certainly able to respond, to react, to a call or an order, to the sign of its name, for example, but certainly not able, even by means of mechanically programmed words, to respond to a question. The question of the response is thus that of the question of the question. This is again that Heideggerian question, first in rank, uh, of the response as response to a question. So the question of the response is also a question uh, of, of the question as well. And let's note here, too, that he's, he's saying, you know, the carts knew very well that the animal uh, uh, responds or at least uh, reacts. OK, uh, the Cartesian animal, like the animal of Kant, Heidegger, Lacan and Levinas, then would therefore would remain incapable of responding to true questioning. This is this becomes the, the major issue then for the animal lacks the power of real questions. I read. I listen, I respond to a question, but also to an invitation or a command. I obey, I present myself in response to a call, an interrogation, an order, a summons, or an injunction. I present myself, the, the phrase I present myself is at the same time the first autobiographical gesture and the gesture of all the here I am's in the history of the law. Okay, so another way to say this then is this again that the question is about the law and who can who can appear before the law, who can be interpolated into the law, and who cannot? Uh, the animal finds itself not able in in uh, the history of philosophy and the way the animal is presented uh, to to become interpolated into the law because they're unable to present themselves before uh, the law as 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 in uh, responding to the social contract. Or, or the covenant. They cannot, in other words, they can't make promises, they can't swear oaths uh, in the way that uh, human beings can when they're questioned about their political uh, affiliations, and so thereby they have, they are not protected uh, by the law. Okay, um, so uh, now I want to turn our attention here to, this is a really uh, important part of Derrida's text, and again, you have to uh, take a moment and kind of think through what he's saying here in relation because he's writing in French and uh, he's going to you know invent uh, this this word this new word he's going to coin a term called the animo which if you're again if you're an English speaker that may not mean uh, anything to you uh, and so I'm just going to pause for a minute on this so the the, the word mo m o t in French mo is uh, the word for word. You know, Annie is from again the relation, the, the prefix for animal. So the animal animo is, uh, you know, he, he he coins this new word, and so animo. Every time we come across this word, animo means, uh, you know, um, 
animal. Okay, so in the French, in the plural form, you say animal. It sounds it sounds the same as animal. So they sound they sound the same. So again, it's just like the je suis, the je suis. It's a kind of a pun going on there. Uh, but uh, but what what we're going to find Derrida observing is that this word itself, the animal, you talk about lacking in, in philosophical rigor. Uh, that 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 the the word animal, it, it, you know, this this is would be a uh, this is a key example, the most important example, I think, of of, of a homo uh, genetic term. This is a, to a totalizing term, like in the sense of Hegelian totalities that deconstruction se seeks to disrupt. That this is a totalizing term, which which uh, you know collapses so much uh, within it. Like we think of, for instance, a mosquito. And, uh, and 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 my friend uh, uh, Shia here, you know, uh, you know, uh, which is obviously not to denigrate the mosquito, but a mosquito is not quite the complex organism uh, of of this uh, beast sitting next to me. And so, uh, you know, but but the word animal collapses all of these complex differences between, you know, uh, all of these creatures that surround us into this one homo uh, homogenizing word. And so Derrida is going to find that even the word itself is, is a monstrous kind of word. And it's very interesting. We really think how interesting it is that in the whole history of philosophy, why did it take until, you know, uh, uh, the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, 20, late uh, 20th, early 21st century, uh, for, for a philosopher to investigate the, the question of the animal. Again, we saw a case of, uh, of, of, of uh, Descartes. He's, he doesn't even ask the question. He, he, you know, it's not, he doesn't, it's not worth his time. He tells us very explicitly. He's not, he doesn't have the time for that question, okay? But no other philosopher has had time for that question either. And so I think this is, uh, again, one of the reasons why it's not just a, this is not just a profoundly responsible uh, instance of deconstruction it's also a very powerful uh, instance and maybe one of the most important contributions Derrida has made to uh, philosophy, this little text, the animal that therefore I am. OK, uh, so he's going to say man in the history of philosophy would be first and foremost those living creatures who have given themselves the word animal that enables them to speak of the animal with a single voice and to designate it as the single being that remains without a response, with the word with which to uh, respond. Okay, what is an animo? Uh, the animal, there you go, say, what a word. Uh, the animal is a word, is it, it is an appellation that men have instituted, a name they have given themselves the right and the authority to give to the living other. Uh, whenever one says, however, the animal, each time a philosopher, anyone who says the animal in the singular, without further ado, claiming thus to, de to designate every living thing that is held not to be human, man as a rational animal, man as political animal, speaking animal, man who says I, uh, it takes and takes himself to be the subject of that statement. Well, each time the subject of that statement, this one, this I, utters an asininity, a bêtise, to put it in the French, um, you know, like like a, a, a something in French. If you say it's uh, ça c'est bête, that means that what a, what a stupidity. Uh, so so the animal and stupidity are explicitly linked in uh, French, and so this translation of bêtise as asininity is is a, is a nice one because it also it, it makes us think of the ass. Um, and this is philosophers as asses, in effect. Philosophers, what Derrida is saying is that philosophers make asses of themselves every time they use the word animal, this totalizing, uh, homogenizing term that is crying for deconstruction. And this is what Derrida is doing. He's deconstructing the word animal. He's, he's fixing his gaze upon this animal to, to uh, deconstruct it for as a matter of, of responsibility. So this is wonderful example of what deconstruction is. Uh, animal is a word that men have given themselves the right to give. They have given themselves this word in order to corral a large number of living beings within a single concept, the animal. Okay. And then Derrida says, I won't repeat the word any mo, any plus mo, uh, too often in order. And he's going to tell us not to damage French ears. He said, but he says, every time I use, either I'm using this word uh, animal or any mo, these animal, uh, I'll be asking you to silently substitute animo for
for what you hear. So he's not going to, you know, he, he playfully throws this out. He's not going to uh, insist upon it, um, you know, but uh, uh, he doesn't, he's, he, he's, he, what, what, what we could really say here is what he's doing with the word animal. And even though he's going to continue to use it is he's doing, this is, this is a term that in deconstruction is called, you know, putting words, you know, under erasure. Okay. What's called suratur. So what, what that means is like sometimes this isn't particularly in Derrida's earlier text. You'll see this is that he'll, you know, word will be published, but then he'll have an X through it. Uh, and so, which is to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using it, but I'm, I'm putting an X through it. Or I'm crossing it out because I want it and I'm leaving the crossing the X through it to indicate to you that, that I'm using the word, but the word that I'm using is, is a problem. And this is, for instance, if you take the word Cora, all right, it's the same it pertains to the word Cora because Cora um, is a, 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 a nothingness. It's absolute nothingness. So if I call Cora Cora, I've already given it a name, and, and so therefore it's, it's 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 being represented. But what's being represented simply isn't there. So even to call it core, and this is what you know deconstruction. Some people have done comparisons of deconstruction and negative theology for the same reason why many, for instance, Orthodox Jews won't use the name of God because to, 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 this would be a violation of the second commandment. You know, it would be giving a representational form to the divine, and so. Uh, you know, but again, uh, you know, because you're, you're naming something that is 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 finally uh, nameless, that is uh, utterly, you know, other. In the same way, you know, Cora, he uses it, but he puts it under erasure. He's doing the same thing here with the word uh, animal. Okay, um, the confusion Derrida tells us of all non-living human creatures within the general and common category of the animal, nanimo, is not simply a sin against rigorous thinking vigilance, lucidity, uh, or empirical authority. And it is all of those things. But it's also, he says, a crime against animals. It's a, to, to use this word to conflate all of these uh, complex creatures under this one uh, term is, is, is not just sloppy thinking and, and irresponsible thinking. Uh, it's, it's actually a crime. Uh, here and then here, he, and this is where you find Derrida. You, you almost never find Derrida talking the language of, of sin, uh, but here we find him, you know, uh, being very strong in his choice of words. He says, "Do we consent to presume that every murder, every transgression of the biblical commandment, thou shalt not kill, concerns only man? All right, or does that commandment apply uh, more generally, not just to human beings, but to animals?" OK, now Derrida is going to observe that in the case of Descartes, in terms of his own asininity uh, regarding the animal or get put in the French bêtise or his stupidity regarding the animal, is that Descartes' fundamental tendency was to make philosophy into absolute or you know, knowledge or called certitude uh, precisely with him. With Descartes, we see something remarkable. Here, philosophizing begins with doubt, and it seems as though everything is put into question. Yet it only seems so. The I or the ego in Descartes is not put into question at all. This illusion and this ambiguity of a critical stance runs right through the whole of modern philosophy up to the most recent present. Descartes had already suspended his confidence in the definition of the self as man and even as rational animal. Okay, now here's this is this is worth uh, stopping here for just a second because. Uh, this is this is what's really you know contradictory in Descartes is that you know we find in discourse on method he uh, you know comes out with this this cogito ergo sum or this assertion I think therefore I am which he says we could we it's completely indoubtable we don't doubt it we it's, it's, we can be absolutely certain that uh, we we exist because we think but then in his meditations uh, Descartes is going to you know admit that he doesn't really even know what it means to be a man much or, or to be rational. And so it's like, what, you know, it's like, it's a completely, you know, it's, it's like, this is also one of the things that deconstruction does is it finds these kinds of, you know, uh, the, the, these, these moments in text that seem to be marginal, but in fact are not marginal at all because they completely transform our way of thinking about what uh, Descartes is saying. And so uh, Derrida is going to look at this passage where Descartes, you know, suspends his definition of man as rational animal. So let's let's read what Derrida says. He says, Descartes had already suspended his confidence in the definition of the self as man 
and even as rational animal in uh, in discourse on excuse me in meditations um, as Descartes sees it such definitions are finally not indoubtable I believe Derrida says one has to attach the greatest importance to the moment of suspension in this text Descartes eliminates in this case any previous affirmations or beliefs that are not you know certain and undoubtable, he eliminates them all of a sudden, he says, so as not to waste time. And this is really interesting. It's like, God, that is so irresponsible. But that's exactly what Descartes does, is he says, I don't have time for it. I'm, 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 I'm you know, I don't, I don't want to you know, further away my time. He says, by, and, and so, and then, because it'll just compound questions, because I will never get to the bottom of it. Admitting then he doesn't even really know what he's talking about. Uh, the meditation suspends this definition of man as rational animal. Descartes cuts things off when in one blow to save time, he eliminates everything that isn't certain and indoubtable. Okay, so here's, let's look at Descartes' language himself. Let's read Descartes. Descartes says, what then did I formerly think I was? A man? But what is a man? Shall I say rational animal? Uh, no, for then I should have to inquire what an animal is, what rationality is. Uh, what the eye of the I think or the res cogitans is. And in this way, one question would lead me down the slope to harder ones. And I wouldn't like to waste the little time and leisure that remains to me by using it to disentangle subtleties of this kind. Okay, so here we see the cavalier philosopher at his most cavalier. Uh, and it's really interesting if you know, he says, am I going to, should I, let's go back. Should I have to inquire what an animal is, what rationality is? Well, there's, you know, uh, there's the, if, if, if man is the rational animal, and he's, he's admitting here, he's not even going to ask the question of what an animal is, nor even of what rationality is. He just, they just are, you know, they, 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 they just exist. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, that's not philosophy. That's the suspension of philosophy uh, in order to assert uh, a thesis. Uh, th but Derrida does observe, this doesn't mean that Descartes was insensitive to the suffering of animals, but he certainly wants to remain indifferent to the philosophical or ethical significance of Bentham's question, can animals uh, suffer? All right, so, uh, you know, maybe he, maybe he was sensitive to the suffering of animals. We know that many of his disciples who came after them were profoundly cruel. Uh, to animals, and this is where we get the beginning of, you know, experimentations on animals that we, you know, like in labs where they just do all kinds of terrible, terrible things to animals. Uh, but, you know, uh, so even if he was aware, though, uh, of and not totally insensitive to the suffering of animals, he certainly was indifferent to Bentham's, que Bentham's question, can animals suffer? It's not a question that he asked or concerned himself with, okay? So I want to conclude this lecture and remind you then that uh, what, what, with something that we, what we started with here, deconstruction is about taking responsibility uh, for the other. It's not about the utterly corrupt pursuit of power. It's one doesn't deconstruct in order to just destroy. One deconstructs as a matter of one's ethical, moral duties uh, to the other. And this is not a incidental feature in Derrida's discourse. This is absolutely part of what he's uh, about uh, as, a, uh, as a philosopher. Um, so we're going to uh, conclude on that note. And, uh, and, and uh, I will have more lectures on Derrida, uh, one on, uh, that's coming up on, um, um, on uh, uh, the ear of the other, uh, among other lectures.